Chapter 14. Conclusion. Elect heirs. Many important truths were to be revealed in this last dispensation, for the Lord has said, dot, 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 I deign to reveal unto my church things which have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world, things that pertain to the dispensation of the fullness of times. D&C 12441. New truths, never before revealed, would be of course very difficult to substantiate from ancient scripture. The Adam-God doctrine would be one of the mysteries of God revealed in this last dispensation of time. The Gospel, as recorded in the New Testament, contains a very minor portion of the words and deeds of Christ. John 21 21-25. Also the Gospel that Jesus taught to the Nephites, as recorded in the Book of Mormon, contains only a lesser part of his teachings. And now there cannot be written in this book even a hundred part of the things which Jesus did truly teach unto the people. And these things have I written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught the people. 3. Nephi 26 6, 8. Mormon continues his narrative and explains why so many teachings have been kept back from his record. Behold, I was about to write them, all which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it saying, I will try the faith of my people. 3 Nephi 26 11. The Lord requires faith from his people. They must search, study, and inquire, receiving line upon line and precept upon precept, until they come to a perfect knowledge, said the prophet Joseph Smith. The things of God are of deep import, and time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. TPJS, page 137. We never can comprehend the things of God and of heaven, but by revelation. We may spiritualize and express opinions to all eternity, but that is no authority. TPJS, page 292. There are but a very few beings in the world who understand rightly the character of God. TPJS, page 343. To understand rightly the character and works of God, it becomes necessary to gain a more sure knowledge of them than is revealed in the scriptures. There is much more danger in disbelieving doctrines than in believing them, for the prophet said, I never hear of a man being damned for believing too much, but they are damned for unbelief. TPJS, page 374. Hence, the danger and difficulty of the restored gospel has never been in believing too much, but rather for believing too little, especially in matters that pertain to the Godhead. Man should gain the same knowledge and testimony that others have gained, and this proposes a serious question a question which the prophet Joseph also asked, I want to ask this congregation, every man, woman and child, to answer the question in their own heart what kind of a being God is. Ask yourselves, turn your thought into your hearts, and say if any of you have seen, heard, or communed with him. This is a question that may occupy your attention for a long time. I again repeat the question, what kind of a being is God? Does any man or woman know? Have any of you seen him, heard him, or communed with him? TPJS, page 343. The prophet infers that man could hear, commune with, and see God. If the saints could achieve this experience and testimony, there would no longer remain any mystery or confusion into the identity of their God. The Lord himself directs this course to pursue. CD and C 93 1, 19. When man attains to this knowledge of God, he has obtained more than the second comforter however, it is through the second comforter, Christ, that the Father is revealed. From experience, the prophet explains. Now what is this other comforter? It is no more nor less than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and this is the sum and substance of the whole matter. That when any man obtains this last comforter, he will have the personage of Jesus Christ to attend him, or appear unto him from time to time. And even he will manifest the Father unto him, and they will take up their abode with him. And the visions of the heavens will be opened unto him, and the Lord will teach him face to face, and he may have a perfect knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. TPJS, page 151. The saints have been encouraged by all of the prophets to seek for this knowledge and testimony, for it is with this knowledge that we may obtain eternal life. A critical warning came from the Lord against those who profess to know God but do not. Behold, vengeance cometh speedily upon the inhabitants of the earth, a day of wrath, a day of burning, a day of desolation, of weeping, of mourning, and of lamentation, and as a whirlwind, it shall come upon all the face of the earth, saith the Lord. And upon my house shall it begin, and from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord, first among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name and have not known me 
and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. D&C 112.24-26 Such an indictment is either directed to those who believe in the doctrine of God being the Adam to this earth, or else it is a judgment against those who have openly opposed it. Hence, the certainty of such a knowledge is of eternal consequence upon those who profess to know God and claim that they are his servants. Only until a man can step forward with this positive knowledge, he will remain susceptible to opinion, uncertainty, and disputation. Anything less than this revelation of God will subject man to question and doubt, but having this grand testimony of God, a man can, at least for himself, end the controversy. The Adam-God doctrine as taught by Brigham Young has been, and will continue to be, a controversial issue. Every serious student of church history will discover it in the pages of the past. Every elder proclaiming the gospel in the mission field will encounter Protestant ministers who will refute it. Seminary leaders, gospel doctrine teachers, and most officials of stakes and wards are often confronted with this doctrine. Perhaps if it had been a subject taught outside the church, or a doctrine originating with apostates, the issue could be easily discarded. But these principles were taught and advocated by the First Presidency of the Church for many years. To disbelieve that doctrine is to cast aspersions upon the reliability of President Brigham Young's second prophet, seer and revelator of the church and others who were his counselors and apostles. Today there are a few Latter-day Saint teachers and educators who advocate the Darwin theory of evolution, and thus proclaim no belief in Adam's mission at all. Some other members believe in the brick Adam, rib Eve creation. Also there are proponents of the theory that Adam was a son of God, the same as everyone else on earth, but by some peculiar twist of fate, he was born with a physical body which became mortalized. Finally, there is a comparatively small portion of members who believe in this doctrine taught by Brigham Young. Hence, Mormons believe in various doctrines pertaining to the creation of the earth and the beginning of man such, as that they came from an ape or a clump of mud. Few there are who believe that they are truly the sons and daughters of God spiritually and physically. This Adam-God doctrine is logical and doctrinally sound, and when one reasons it out to its full measure, it renders a deeper and closer respect for the Father and his condescending fall for his children. The Apostle George Q. Cannon, captivated the spirit of the doctrine by alluding to the nearness that these teachings bring man to God. President Young, in the foregoing passages, while substantiating the fact of the union of man's pre-existing spirit with a bodily product of the dust of the ground, enters more particularly into the modus operandi of that union. He unmistakably declares man's origin to be altogether of a celestial character that not only is his spirit of heavenly descent, but his bodily organization, too that the latter is not taken from the lower animals, but from the originally celestial body of the great father of humanity. Taking the doctrine of man's origin as seen from this higher point of view, and comparing it with the low assumptive theories of uninspired men, such as those we have alluded to, how great the contrast appears. Look on this picture man, the offspring of an ape, and on this man, the image of God, his father, how wide the contrast, and how different the feelings produced in the breast. In the one case, we instinctively shrink with dread at the bare insinuation, while in the other, the heart beats with higher and warmer and stronger emotions of love, of adoration, and praise, the soul is cheered and invigorated in its daily struggles to emancipate itself from the thraldom of surrounding evils and darkness, pertaining to this lower sphere of existence, and is animated with a purer and nobler zeal in its onward and upward journey to that divine presence whence it originally came. Mill, Star 23 654. Eclipse of the Adam God Doctrine. In summary, from 1852 until his death in 1877, President Brigham Young publicly advocated the following principles of the Adam God Doctrine. 1. Adam was not created as an adobe brick, nor did Eve literally evolve from Adam's disconnected rib. 2. Mankind and all other life was not originated by any other principle than by the propagation of species, through seed of its own kind. 3. Adam and Eve came into the Garden of Eden with physical, tangible, immortal bodies not spirits. 4. Those bodies were of a celestial perfection before the fall. 5. Adam possessed an immortal, celestial, physical body in a resurrected state. 6. Resurrected beings in the celestial kingdom, which propagate their species, are exalted beings gods and goddesses. 7. Resurrected, exalted beings can produce only spirit children. 8. When Adam and Eve partook of mortal food, their bodies became filled with the seeds of death, which was blood. With blood in their systems, all children born to them would be physical and mortal and subject to death. 
9. The fall of Adam and Eve was actually the changing of the spiritual fluid in their systems, to the mortal fluid called blood. Thus the fall was from immortality to mortality. 10. Michael was the principal creator of this world, later to be called Adam. 11. Every woman, who remains faithful to the gospel, will become an Eve to other earths similar to this one. 12. Eve was one of Adam's wives. 13. Adam, or Michael, is the literal father of the spirits of all men. 14. Adam, or Michael, is the literal and spiritual father of the Savior. 15. Brigham Young said this doctrine was revealed to him from heaven. Those few individuals who believe in the Adam God doctrine feel that they can hold their heads high with dignity, for they can claim a close filial relationship to their God. While some attribute their beginning to monkeys, or mud, those who believe in the teachings of President Brigham Young and Joseph Smith claim to be the elect heirs of heaven and earth, because they are the literal children of God. Appendix. In the month of February, 1848, the Twelve Apostles met at Hyde Park, Potawatomi County, Iowa, where a small branch of the church was established. Dot, 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 dot. We were in prayer and council communing together, and what took place on that occasion? The voice of God came from on high, and spake to the council. Every latent feeling was aroused, and every heart melted. What did it say unto us? Let my servant Brigham step forth and receive the full power of the presiding priesthood in my church and kingdom. This was the voice of the Almighty unto us at Council Bluffs, before I removed to what was called Canesville. It has been said by some that Brigham was appointed by the people, and not by the voice of God. I do not know that this testimony has often, if ever, been given to the masses of the people before, but I am one that was present, and there are others here that were also present on that occasion, and did hear and feel the voice from heaven, and we were filled with the power of God. This is my testimony, these are my declarations unto the saints unto the members of the kingdom of God in the last days, and to all people. We said nothing about the matter in those times, but kept it still. After seating myself in the stand, I was reminded of one circumstance that occurred, which I omitted in my discourse. Men, women, and children came running together where we were, and asked us what was the matter. They said that their houses shook, and the ground trembled, and they did not know, but that there was an earthquake. We told them that there was nothing the matter not to be alarmed, the Lord was only whispering to us a little, and that he was probably not very far off. We felt no shaking of the earth or of the house, but were filled with the exceeding power and goodness of God. We knew and realized that we had the testimony of God within us. On the sixth day of April following, at our annual conference, held in the Log Tabernacle at Canesville, the propriety of choosing a man to preside over the church was investigated. In a very few minutes it was agreed to, and Brigham Young was chosen to fill that place without a dissenting voice, the people not knowing that there had been any revelation touching the matter. They ignorantly seconded the voice of the Lord from on high in his appointment. Dot dot dot. Some persons say that Brigham does not give revelations as did Joseph Smith. But let me tell you, that Brigham's voice has been the voice of God from the time he was chosen to preside, and even before. Orson Hyde, J.D. 8 233-234